format. I'm Sven Harvey. And I'm David Zabiria. And tonight we're going to be having a look at two of the original colour handheld game consoles. Now I, I was always quite chuffed with the links over the Game Gear because I was like, ah, oh, it's a 16 bit handheld. And then um, when I was saying to you, you know what, this would be great, you know, we, we can explain why. The, the Game Gear did so much better than Lynx, even though the Lynx was 16-bit, and you went to me, N -n -n no. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it was, look, it's on the packaging, it says right here, 16-bit. Yeah. The look on your face is like, you didn't check the spec sheet, did you? <laughs> right, now, because I haven't checked the spec sheet, and the packaging clearly says 16-bit, what was the architecture types? Well, let, let's just point out something about Atari. A little later on, they released something called a Jaguar and said that was 64-bit. Okay, so the advertising <laughs> wasn't always... But saying that, you can buy two gigabyte hard drives, two terabyte hard drives, and um, they're not two terabyte. Well, they are before we format them. <laughs> This car will do 100 miles an hour as long as you don't want to sit in it and drive it. <laughs> yeah. It's no. Yeah, exactly. It, it I know what you mean. Count. The thing is, um, this has got a Zilog Z uh, Z80 processor in it, which is basically the same as the one that was in the ZX Spectrum as well as the Master System. This has the 6502 processor in it, which is basically the same as the one that was in the Vic 20. Yes. And the thing is, is this is a special version of that processor, which, though it is 8-bit internally, had a 16-bit address bus. Mm. So it could cross-connect to some of the other equipment on the motherboard, which included a 16-bit main graphics processor chip called Suzy. Ah, oh, those Amiga boys knew how to yeah. name things, yeah. didn't they? Because this was basically developed under the auspices of some of the team that worked on the Amiga originally, mm. while this was an Apix project before Apix started having problems, asked Atari on board, and Atari basically just took over the project. Yeah, but to be fair, when Apix had this in mind with their original concept, mm. they weren't cartridges. No, they were tapes. <laughs> Which is quite bizarre as a handheld that you loaded with cassette tape. But, but could you imagine how awesome it would have been if it had been taped? Because I bet you if it had have had that, yeah. there'd have been a button on the side and you'd have been able to use it as a Walkman. There is that if they'd have gone that way. But what I believe was going to happen is you just hooked a Walkman up to it. Oh. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, um, because they were never going to expect you to record onto the tape like you would do with a Spectrum or no. Commodore 64 or something. So it was just literally going to be the headphone port going into a data room. But saying that, the um, they still had sort of a, a technological lap over between the two concepts because this has got a horrible loading time. Yeah. And the reason, you copies it to RAM. Yeah, copies it to RAM. Even though the, 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 the game's on a ROM chip, mm. it can't read the ROM chip directly, so it has to copy the ROM chip into RAM and then run the game from RAM, which was a bit of a shame and kind of held it back a little bit yeah. um, because it meant that it didn't really have enough RAM to chuck the data around properly in 16-bit of the address bus. I'll tell you what, though. How clever was the design for the game oh, cartridge? Yeah. For this? I mean, you compare... Well, quite. The size, the weight, yeah. the style of the two cartridge systems. But well, this is the funny thing with these is you can actually see the chip. Yeah, um, so yeah, but through the plastic. Well, only through the plastic. plastic I mean, but, yeah. unless you get a hammer to it, yeah, you can't really damage this. See, this is one of the other things as well. You'd have to go to such an extent to damage the the chips on these, yeah. and yet. With that, not so much. With yeah, these. That, that, that could break quite easily. Yeah. To the point where well, it people did, and they just slide in minutes. Yeah. These you couldn't really damage, mm. which I thought. As long as you weren't going too mental, because those teeth could wear through if you weren't careful. Yeah, but you'd have to be really oh, yeah. going at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Mind you, saying that you'd have to really go at it to shatter the case, but need need, need the hair yeah, there. I, I just I liked the design, and to tell you the truth, I really thought that this was going to be. The major player. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you why I thought it, and then you, you tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. You could play two player. Yeah, that was always Okay, cool. there was only a handful of games that did it. Yeah, that, that, that was quite cool. The screen, backlit, obviously, because yeah. you know, all the colour screen, well, all the colour screens. The colour screen, they were backlit. Well, the thing is with that is, is again, you've got. Echoes of the Amiga in it because it's got 4,096 colours on screen, yes. just like an A500 did. It, it was, it just, 
it feels like a better machine. Hmm. The quality of it was better. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm the first to admit that I don't think that half of the catalogue of games actually fully utilised the chipset on board. I think yeah. they were just straight over ports. Which is a shame, because the ones that did, the graphics were just stunning. Yeah. For, for, for a handheld of the, the time. Game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it rivaled some of the, the, the home consoles back then. Because you've got to bear in mind, in the States, this actually came out in 1989. And this came out in 1990. Yeah. So yeah, technically, it was, a it's more, it was a superior console, but it was out, you know, a, a year earlier. Um, well, how, what was the price difference between the two units? At launch in the States, it was 180 yeah. and 150. So it was not That's... a great deal of difference. By the time uh, we got the links in the UK, because we didn't get it here for a year, yeah, it, was it came out at 130, whereas the Game Gear came out around about the same time at 100. Mm. So that's worth bearing in mind. I think one of the other factors was that not all the game catalogue for links was available in the stores at the time, where a good chunk of it was available for the Game Gear. Yeah, I mean, the Game Gear kind of was cheating, because essentially the hardware in there is the same as in the Master System, yeah. which is why you could get the adapter, so you could play the Master System games on it. Yeah, it was a, a cartridge clip-on. Yeah, course, basically, it? it was a quite big, chunky thing that went on to it, but you just plugged in the, the, the Master System games into the top and you were away. Mm. And indeed, most of, most of the cartridges of the games that were out in both formats were literally just straight ports on different chips essentially, and in the little cartridge. So that made sense, which is why it got Sonic the Hedgehog almost immediately, and so on and so forth. I th one of the things that really drew me to this when I, I first got it was I had the TV adapter for it. Mm, yes. Which was just a cartridge that went into that, which meant I had a portable colour television. television. Yeah. Now, to anybody that's not our age group, that's not impressive. Cause yeah, of Tablets, phones, <laughs> yeah. watches. Yeah, but back then that was that, that was quite really thing. cool. So many companies tried doing portable TVs and they never really took off, did they? The handheld. No, no, they, they tended to be dedicated units, but they yeah. always had trouble with interference with the the yeah. signals. Which, to be fair, this still had, but because of the chipset on board, it meant they could really concentrate on the cartridge, and they they did do a really good, good job, job on that. that. Yeah, it was actually I think like, I remember the reviews for it kind of and they're basically saying it was one of the best handheld televisions you could get at the time. It was. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Mind you saying that, because of the initial cost of it plus the cost of the cartridge, it would have probably been one of the most expensive handheld televisions in that era. I'd have to check the figures, but well, I most don't of, think Most of them were running around at, I think, 99.99, certainly the Sinclair one was. Yeah. Um, and of course that was 99.99 plus the cost of the TV cartridge, which I think was £70. It was, I don't yeah. know. Because the Master System adapter seemed quite expensive considering it was literally just converting this car, the, the Master System cartridge down to this form factor. Now you know, I, it was one of those gadgets I never got. Hmm. I never got that one. I think it was retained at 35, maybe 30, something. I don't like think that. the cost would have put me off at it's that point in time. I, I don't think I knew it existed at the time. Yeah. and. Whilst I know it exists now, I don't really have one in my collection mm. because if I want to play that, I'd just hook the thing up. Yeah. It's the idea of messing about. To, I, and yeah, I'll do it for the Nintendo. I, you know, yeah, I've I'd got all the be. Game Boy ones. But we're not doing Nintendo because yes. black and white colour. Yes, absolutely. Now, one of the things about the Lynx, of course, was the fact it wasn't released in Japan, which was a bit of a problem for it. So a lot of games that were coming out in Japan just didn't come to it. Um, the British games, on the other hand, tended to be straight ports from Master System, straight Game Gear versions. And the arcade machines as well, because yeah. one of the reasons why I still recommend these to people, when they're going, oh, you know, there isn't a big game out, and I'm like, what do you mean about there isn't a big game? There are always games out there if you go looking for them, but everybody wants all the new releases, and I was like, mm. well, you know, you could spend 40 or 50 quid on that, or pick up one of these, which you can do from, I don't know, say, 15 upwards, depending yeah. on how good the backlight still is and how much damage there is to the unit. But you can pick up, I mean, you can buy these, still brand new, never opened. They were like 120 quid, but you yeah. can get them. But the game catalogues, I mean, Spider-Man, Lemmings, uh, all the Sonic games, of yeah. course. I mean, even, I've even got a couple of the Star Trek games. Yeah. 
And it's ironically, and you pointed this out, which I loved, which was both of those Star Trek games are still better than the one they've just had. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the interesting things, actually, is Road Blasters was actually an Atari 10 gen um, arcade machine. Yeah. So it didn't come out on an awful lot of machines. Um, we got it on the Amiga, mm. got it on Commodore 64, but as far as the games consoles were concerned, it was pretty much just Atari. Um, so that was a, that was quite a, an interesting little exclusive exclusive for this. Um, of course, Lemmings, for instance, came out on everything. Yeah. It's it's very telling that Lemmings on those two machines is identical. Yes. Because the Lynx didn't really make much of an impact in the UK. So literally, when they did Lemmings on the Lynx, they just so, commercially speaking, which unit do you actually felt won? Um, out of these two, it was definitely the Game Boy. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we, we know our history. Yeah, yeah. The Game Boy did win in a big way. But, common, it, it's over common sense. Yeah. Somebody says to you, which would you prefer? Monochrome, because we can't call it black and white, because it was black and green. green. Or colour... <laughs> With much higher resolution... And a nice backlight. Yeah. They should have won hands down, but... Let's face it, design was the, the, the thing that killed these. They were bigger. Yeah. Both units took six AA batteries. batteries. Yeah. And, you know, price of batteries back then was high. Yeah, can try them now. You couldn't get... Re well, you could get rechargeables, but, but they, they were very slow. Really. And nine times... Well, yeah, because they didn't have the full voltage. Yeah. So they couldn't really power them. So you were stuck using power adapters. Where the Game Boy only used four, you could get a really good yeah. um, lifespan of it. And they did dedicated battery packs, yeah. which really helped them out over these. Yeah. But you know what? Even if you put the power aside, I think what really did it for them was the fact that you couldn't put them in your pocket with yeah. a Game Boy you could. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I would bring the power back into it because after you're thinking about it, the Game Boy, because it could go in a pocket and because it used four AA batteries and it didn't drain them in 45 minutes or 30 minutes, mm. that's why that took off. With these guys, unless you were an absolute millionaire with buying, being able to buy batteries, not only could you not get it in your pocket, you couldn't take it out of the house because you'd have to plug it into the wall anyway. Yeah, yeah, but, but I handheld. Yeah. They, they were. A but, drawback. but also, to be fair, I mean, we have to take this one out of the next statement. Yeah. Lynx and Nintendo both cheated over the Game Gear because both of those had a history of releasing handheld games. Yes. Um, I will admit that Nintendo's was far superior. Uh, I can't remember what those things were Game called. Game Watch. That's it, Game and Watch. I remember the which one was it? Um, it was dual screen. Donkey Kong. That's the one. Donkey, Donkey Kong Don on the Game and Watch. It's a DS. Yeah. If you basically, compare those you two at, together, yeah, it's, it's, it's a DS. The design was there. They had the idea for the screens. They had the idea for the battery use for how to get the most out of the speed. They put so much thought into the design of those that. It's kind of ironic, because uh, I know you've got one in your collection, I don't have one in mine because I, I wore mine out donkeys ago and I've never replaced it. Donkeys ago, but yeah, bum ba -bum -bum. <laughs> But you put the two next to it, you put a DS next to that and I'm yeah. telling you, it, it's... That's where it came from, I mean, yeah. it's, it's no no surprise that Mr Game Watch turned upon the DS. <laughs> <laughs> now... Atari had already done a couple of handhelds. Mm. Um, we were calling they didn't them handhelds very loosely, though. Aren't okay, we? <laughs> dedicated portable game. Yeah, the um, size crystal of dinner plate. <laughs> crystal display. Yeah. You know, not good, particularly good life out of the batteries. I mean, the watch batteries for most yeah. of them, and you know, they, they were fine. Um, so it's it's one of those. They were slightly ahead of their time by this is what we want to do. Yeah. In comparison to where we are. I mean, like now with lithium and all the rest of the singing and sing batteries, you know, handouts are fine. And, yes. you know, I run both of these on modern rechargeables. I do it on the uh, 2900s. Yeah. 
they work fine because you've got you because the, they're actually 1.5 volt rather than the 1.2 volt ones we had back then yeah and even and not only were they 1.2 but the, the, the power in them was less than the thousands, thousands of yeah, pounds, i think it yeah. was something like eight 800 think. something like that it so even if they could power them properly they wouldn't have powered them for very long no <laughs> so I, I think there was many things that was a problem 150 pounds back then yeah was a lot more than it is now to be fair absolutely um, not being particularly portable mm. was a factor. Battery uses, as you say, unless yeah. you could afford them, they were very expensive. And let's face it, Nintendo came out with a much better console. They they didn't try to push the envelopes of technology. They went with gaming and let's face it, Tetris. Yeah. Exactly, this is the thing that when, when the Game Boy came out in 1989 in this country, these two were still a year away. And for your £129.99, which is what the, the original Game Boy retailed for initially, you got the machine, you got Tetris, you got a set of batteries, a pair of headphones, and the four player cable, so you could play Tetris four player with other people with the Game Boy. Yeah. Even before you picked up any games separately. Yeah. So, you know, and then the Game Boy kind of had an advantage in the UK that it didn't have elsewhere because again because it had a Z80 processor but because it was monochrome the Celtic Spectrum games were running around ported to it quite easily yeah. hence Robocop and so on and so forth coming out on them mm -hmm. which all came out in 1989-1990 because they were already out on the Spectrum so, and yeah. Nintendo had also really already got it into the, the mind of the public as yeah. such Family friendly gaming. Yeah, absolutely. But it, as a, it is such a shame because they really did have great arcade games mm. of their time and they were fun. They yeah. really were. Of course, the Game Gear. No, I mean, the, the problem was the Game Gear had more games out at the time. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not actually sure how many games the Lynx had out at that period in time. But I do remember not a lot of stores carried no. them. Certainly didn't carry the whole range. Where, which is strange because Atari, you'd have thought, yeah. where the Game Gear, yeah. almost everywhere carried. Yeah, I mean it started with columns really on that. That's that's what grabbed attention. Was that their it. big game? Yeah, but the year after is when Sonic. Came out. Yeah, because didn't Sonic come out across all platforms at that point? Yeah, well, it was across all the Sega platforms. Yeah, so, so the Mega Drive had eked its way into the market, um, though not through Sega quite yet. It was quite a bizarre situation um, uh, in 1990, because the, the Mega Drive actually came out in 1989 in Japan, and some eked into the British market with all switches mm. on and all sorts of weird and wonderful things. But it was officially released in the UK before Sonic 1 came out, and Sonic 1 came out on Mega Drive. Master System and Game Gear as, as one release. Um, I can tell you they're both out on the same same time because I can remember the bloody music going on next to my <laughs> counter all day. Um, it was horrible as well. I, I do specifically. <laughs> it was. I do, I do remember thinking there are far superior machines capable of playing music in this store, and yet you've got that thing. Oh, tell me about it. This is one thing that drove me mental about video gaming around about that time. Is everyone was basically going, oh, all the music is beepy and bloppy, and then I put Shadow of the Beast on the Amiga, and everybody just went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was always the Amigas when you have it. Yeah. Not that you were biased towards them at all. What? <laughs> Never. No, no. No, you see, it's one of those things. It's a shame. It's, it's like the whole cassette tape, 8-track, yeah. well, guess what, the CDs. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're fun. I still recommend people, yeah, if... Check if them out, Yeah, absolutely. check them out. I mean, you can pick them up so cheaply if you you don't get mint in box ones or anything yeah. like but that. But the thing is, the fact that you can still get mint in box ones. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing was the Lynx, actually, is a load of Lynx 2s were found, um, I think in the late 90s, early 2000s, something like that. Uh, a, game, uh, a company called Teddy Game was re uh, refurbishing them to make sure they were fully functional and actually released some new games at the time. Oh, I didn't know so, about that. Yeah. How come you didn't cool. tell me about that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, well... Um, For some reason they were actually advertising Amiga mags. It was bizarre, yeah. Okay, oh. so... If you had to choose one of the two units, what would your choice be? Oh, this is difficult because the problem is, is I want to go with the Lynx. 
Because the links is the technology is better. But the problem is, is that there was so much more software on the Game Gear. Yeah, so much more. Um, any last thoughts on these two? Well, I th I don't think we've covered it. The the technology in this is far superior. Much easier to get a working one of these today in really good condition. And and the power packs are cheap and yeah, they're fab. But the game catalogue is harder to get hold of yeah. and is more expensive. But saying that, in the grand scheme of things, when you consider an, an Xbox One game is 50 quid, yeah. it, it's not. Uh, technology, you've got to hunt around to try and find one that's... In good nick, in because good they never tend to be kicked around floors. Well, yeah. But a massive pack game yeah. catalogue, and the games are far cheaper. I mean, how many games fairs are you at and you just see a whole box of them yeah, you hunt through exactly. them and yeah so right. yeah uh, to tell you the truth uh, buy them both yeah if you get a chance give yeah. them a go so thank you for watching and don't forget you can subscribe to us here on YouTube you can follow us on Twitter and on Facebook and check out our new website as well thank you and good night good night